Greetings and welcome back to another discussion. It's been a while. Very pleased to bring you today's discussion. I'm joined by a guest who is eminently qualified to discuss the matter at hand, and that is the relationship of gay men to heterosexual women. Now, you might think at the outset that this is not an interesting topic, but I can tell you why it is. And this is because men and women, that is heterosexual men and women, exist in a natural state of asymmetry. They have very, very distinct reproductive needs and desires. Of course, there's some overlap, but the distinctions are such that they're greater than the overlap, I would argue. And they're brought together for no other reason other than reproduction. And the proxy, of course, is you know, copulation, sexual desire, but ultimately the, the, the ultimate cause of that is reproduction, proximate being the sexual attraction. But one would have to be completely blind to the idea that there exist gay men, and they too must coexist in the world with human women who are largely heterosexual, and we'll talk about the relationship with gay men and, and lesbian women uh, later on, which is interesting in itself. Because, at least theoretically, heterosexual women should not possess any power or influence over gay men, and yet, if you examine the culture, and certainly the political culture, there tends to be a lot of overlap. There are various phrases, catchphrases people use, you know, uh, women and minorities. Now, this is always interesting because women are not a minority by any stretch. They're 50% of the human population. Gay men are technically a, a form of minority. But the question we need to examine today is what, given these differences, given the fact that in theory, gay men would or should have nothing to do with women because there is no biological pull there per se, they're not interested in having sex with them and they're not interested in reproducing with them per se, you know, that this question demands an answer, at least some kind of examination. And it's to this end that I have invited my current guest on. He is both very intelligent and happens to be gay as well, and so he's better qualified at looking at the nuances and details here. So, Inquisitive, why don't we start here with this point of departure, this idea that men and women, heterosexual men and women, we, they're drawn to each other because birds and the bees, it's just how nature works for the most part in a sexually dimorphic species. But the dynamic would fundamentally have to be different if there's no sexual interest. As we can observe, generally speaking, men prefer to hang out with men and women prefer to hang out with women when it's not in a sexual context. So what happens when gay men are thrust into a world where the majority of people are heterosexual and they still have to deal with and oftentimes coexist in an amiable and amicable manner with, with women. So what are your initial thoughts on that? Well, I think that it's it's a little bit more obvious as to why gay men would hang out with, with women in the first place, especially straight women, just because with femininity being such a prominent thing in both groups, they'll naturally have an affinity for each other. And just because of there's only a 2.2% of the U.S. male population, for example, is gay, um, there's not going to be a lot of gay men around you unless you live in a city. So what's the next best thing for femininity after gay men? It's women, right? And a lot of their interests obviously will align when it comes to makeup, drama, tea, the idea of being extra, or even relating on the idea that, quote unquote, men are the worst, right? Because they're both dating men and not necessarily making the best decisions either as to who to date. Blah, 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 blah. Brief question on the on the, the, this matter of femininity. Obviously, mm -hmm. there does appear to be some crossover and sort of feminine interest, but on the other hand, I don't want to turn this into sort of dichotomous nurture-nature binary, but do you think this is congenital, that in general, gay men have, on average, greater interest in 
the kinds of things that women find interesting, whether it's makeup, uh, social groups, things like that? Or do you think this is, at least to some degree, some sort of cultural pressure that's exerted on them for a variety of reasons? I think, yes, naturally, there there is an affinity for femininity, just because gay men tend to be a lot more sensitive when it comes to emotions. They're more willing to talk about emotions amongst each other or with their gal pals, right? And if they were to talk to this with straight men, for example, most of the time you don't really get anywhere. You mainly when you're hanging out with straight men, you're talking about interests, things, blah, 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 blah. But when you talk to women, you're talking to them about drama, tea, or even sometimes, you know, with, with that tea and that gossip, you're kind of looking at destroying someone's reputation sometimes, too, which is something that I find that both groups do enjoy. Um, and it's, it's a tactic that both enjoy, uh, both groups enjoy doing. You, you don't really, or most gay men won't really get that kind of thing with straight men just because most of the time, the more feminine gay men just don't relate to straight men at all, right? There's, with gay men, you have this eye for beauty, for makeup, right? It's not the same, it's not the quite, uh, the same as women um, and with straight men you don't necessarily have that that want to do art on the body or even just art well, in terms of oh, go. To, to your point I mean this is obviously anecdotal um, mm-hmm. so this is my text, textual communication with you that you tend to embellish quite a bit with emojis this could be attributable to you as an individual um and as well as the thing we just recently discussed a sort of extended okay and my misinterpretation of that as well as well my relative curtness and and bluntness i just don't i happen for better or worse not to be gay probably for worse (laughs) but that that sort of thing trying to communicate um some sort of additive feature in in text might be something like that but i that's interesting i mean certainly women and one of their taxes is in their in their groups to engage in sort of reputational smearing uh this is usually a sexual strategy in the sense that they're trying to put other women down a peg or knock them down a peg rather mm-hmm. in order to establish their own sort of social hierarchies and i was unaware of this i mean i, I kind of have this image in my head now Certainly, an image of women saying, "Oh, did you see the dress Sally was wearing? Oh my God, it's so bad!" And I, I can't really imagine a gay man doing like, but, but maybe they do do that. Maybe it's, maybe it's something similar along those lines. It's a lot more subtle in terms of the way that they do it. They won't necessarily say it outright, but they will cause a lot of problems, a lot of drama. Um, most gay men really aren't the most articulate when it comes to their feelings. Uh, They know they're feeling it. They'll know that they'll be mad. But instead of usually engaging it with another, with with the other person, instead they will do a lot of reputation smearing. That's where the gossip comes in. That's where the drama comes in. That's where you go into someone's DMs, you talk to one of your friends about XYZ person, right? And then more gossip comes out. And then that, that is like the level of reputation smearing where it comes off as, oh, uh, I'm worried about person X, Y, Z. This is what they did to me. Do you know if anything is wrong with them? And then person B will respond back with, well, maybe it's because of reason one, reason two, reason three, right? And that will be used later as ammo for reputation smearing once everyone is together as a as a group as a click and once one person gets ticked off that ammo comes out and is blasted and that's when a lot of the reputation the drama ensues it's it's one of those things where um i noticed that straight women tend to enjoy these kinds of stories and that's why they 
enjoy associating with gay men because when you hear these really extra so stories, they're they can be sometimes out of this world, like literally. Mm. So, and you propose your hypothesis is that this is largely congenital. This isn't simply a a cultural additive. This is uh, essentially just because there's some preliminary data that suggests that yeah, there there's some overlap in in the in the brain structure of gay men and and heterosexual mm -hmm. women maybe that has something to do with it i don't think too much is known but i mean if you ask gay men in general well, what do they enjoy you'll get desperate housewives right or some kind of contrived drama in some kind of way that you, that's why you see men in or gay men in drama doing acting right or even um the popular quote unquote gay dancer, right? So they'll be being extra manic, extra manic, anything like that. Um, because gay men tend to like giving it a giving a performance, right? The the set of masculine uh the masculine gay men, they don't really engage in that that often. But I do notice that they do like hearing about it more than straight men. So even with the more masculine gay men, when they do talk to women, they'll kind of get it out of uh, the drama out of the women just to like hear about it in some kind of way. So if we were to remain on this point, it seems to me that to the, the extent that there's no sexual interest or, or reproductive interest between gay men and straight women, nonetheless, the sphere of interest is sort of gossip or reputational smearing damage that there's enough in terms of the mental emotional interests that such that they might be uh, they might be drawn to each other if only because they share certain commonalities right exactly and it's one of their ways to quote unquote they call each other sisters with each other right your sisters even if you're gay you're a sister right and it's it's very easy to develop that platonic relationship just because with the straight women i know they put off their guard immediately when they know that I'm gay. And um, even if I'm talking in a more masculine manner, the minute I tell them, oh yeah, I've dated men, immediately I become their best friend, I become their accessory, they tell me everything in their life that is messy. And a lot of the time, they want to hear my opinion about it, I just end up becoming their therapist and I, I know that other gay men kind of have this experience too just because a lot of straight men straight women want their gay best friend to go shopping with to do makeup with to essentially just kind of be one of the girls but not really one of the girls um, there's that novelty there that you don't really get with um your other girls just you because you use the word accessory. I find that fascinating. Yeah. Uh, because it se that seems to be kind of almost hitting the nail on the head. That it's, as you pointed out, something novel. There's enough commonality and, and I guess similarity in some respects that there's some overlap. But it doesn't, if you say accessory, that implies that there's something inauthentic about it. Oh, yeah. It's definitely inauthentic at times because they're more interested not in you as a person but potentially the stories that you can tell them so when it comes to women they're very interested in hearing about gay relationships they're because a lot of gay relationships are not stable they start very quickly they end very quickly and they move on very quickly right it, it's this is one of those common things between gay men and women where they are um, or I should say, um, bombs tend to be a lot more hypergamous. So, um, and usually it's these, um, B bottoms, those who take, yeah, bottoms, the, right, right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, with, with bottoms, they tend to be the, the ones who are friends with women and, um, with bottoms, there's this whole entire idea that, oh, you go find a sugar daddy, right? You don't want a Camry daddy. You don't want a Mercedes daddy. You want a Ferrari daddy, right? You don't want anything less than that. And women love hearing about it. Um, 
there are a lot of gay men that do engage in that sugar baby lifestyle. Mm. Um, even though it's not the majority of gay men, when you hear about it, it's it it really sounds like a fairy tale to a lot of women, and it, and it's out of the world. It's interesting though, because I, I know we've discussed this somewhat privately, but this idea that I mean, obviously, sometimes people joking it's sort of tops and bottoms, but the idea that bottoms might actually have some fundamentally different phenotype from a top, uh, be it them being more feminized or just pursuing behavior or engaging in behaviors that are that could be likened more to, to females, whereas tops are, I suppose, you know, more dominant, more masculine. Do you think this is just sort of a natural division and you could that you could you, these these phenotypes, we'll call them that, are actually attributable to fundamental differences within the gay population in terms of behavior and maybe even at the, at the level of the endocrine system, uh, neurology, etc.? I think that you could, in their behaviors, I think you can make a good generalization on a lot of things, but at the same time, you do find that there are what we call blouses, which are feminine men who are tops, too. And that's something to, that you would have to take into account for, because tops are a lot more complicated, but bottoms are usually complete stereotypes. Like, it's a joke within the gay community that 90% the gays out there are all bottoms and the tops don't exist which is uh potentially interesting because um even with with regard to uh sodomy right uh that's more of a recent thing amongst gay men uh with the gay men i know and before in the 70s 80s they don't really engage in that that much but this could just be due to um, gay men being uh, very hypersexual and really watching a lot of porn. Like the, mm. the culture, gay culture is very sexual. But well, that's see, and thing. that's fascinating, this point, because um, I know of an individual who was very insistent that this is based on faulty data, that to the extent that the quote unquote gay community, and that's another interesting topic, sort of collective think, thinking and what have you. Mm -hmm. appears to be hypersexualized, appears to engage in a lot of uh, a lot more sex than your standard male would at least assuming he had ac access to the same amount he he was insistent this is based on faulty data and that the the breakdown is more or less how should I put it um, it's similar to, to straight people but your contention is that the gay gay men on average are more sexually active they tend to have more partners they tend to would, would you say that's accurate i would say that in my area yes um and at the same time uh due to the area I live in being pretty much a city it, it, you, you see this happen a lot like we have a term uh eskimo brothers right where if you if you and person b have had an entanglement with person C, per, you and person B are now Eskimo brothers, right? That's right. That, that's something that happens a lot, and it gets to a point to where um, you can find yourself being mutual friends with someone who's a, across a, one country or even in another country that, and you've never met them in your life, and yet you have like twenty mutual friends. It does strike so, me though on the point that. There's going to be a sampling bias for a number of reasons. I mean, I'm not, I'm not really decided either way on this issue. I'm not going to make one assumption, but one way or another. But cities right. have large populations, obviously. So you're, by natural, you're going to get larger representation of whatever, in this case, uh, gay men. If cities naturally draw the so subpopulation within the gay population of, to engage in of the sort that gay just more in sort of hypersexualized behavior, that's going to be more uh, apparent because of the sampling bias, because you're going to, these are the types of guys that are going to be doing that. Um, I'm not sure okay. one way or another, but I, I think that we tend to, when we get a, when we try to develop a view of certain groups of people, the view is always colored by the larger sample size available. And, and urbanites in general are going to provide more data, whatever they're, whether it's an ethnic group or, uh, or a, uh, in this case, a sexual orientation group, whatever it might be, religious group, 
they're going to be able to at least give you a picture of something in some kind of microcosm much more readily than someone in a more rural area or somebody far removed from that. Also, uh, to the extent that, I mean, one thing, because we've talked about this as well in the past, um, something like Tinder. Now, it, there is this, this hypothesis in, say, the manosphere that Tinder in general has sort of taken over the dating scene. And certainly people might, heterosexual men, might feel drawn to it because it's sort of the platform where things are done for the most part these days. At least that's my superficial impression. But the problem with this is that the types of people who are not going to be naturally inclined, because your tendency, for example, towards monogamy or uh, polygyny or just in general how flexible you are and, and the number of partners you want to have, that's going to be mediated at the individual level, largely by genes interacting with the environment. So the people who, and we'll get back to the gay thing in a bit, the, in, the, in, the, in the Tinder example, it sure seems like everyone is on Tinder and it's controlling the entire landscape of heterosexual dating. But you, the thing is, you never hear from the people who don't participate in it because they're either not talking about it or they're in some kind of reasonably stable monogamous relationship and they didn't achieve that or they didn't pursue it vis-a-vis -vis tinder tinder would strike me it wouldn't be that sort of thing where that you would use to achieve that and so again i think that it becomes very difficult to ascertain the actual tendencies of a, of a group because precisely because of social media large cities uh versus the members and i don't know what the percentages would be who don't do that i have no for example idea how many how many men and women are more averse to using things like tinder because by nature they're less uh sexually active they're you know that's going to vary your mileage there is going to vary depending on how you are basically your genes so i i have to wonder about that at times that we're just not getting a complete picture of anything, whether it's in the heterosexual market or the or the gay market. Um, but but I, I guess I want to offer as a caveat that you're an urbanite, you're a city dweller, and so everything you're saying is relevant, perhaps to the the city area in a we could agree a very superficial, probably one of the most superficial places on the planet. And so that's going to have some kind of effect on on the on the sampling there. Yeah. Oh, oh, definitely, definitely. Um, just because there's so many people flying into my city in particular, to the point where you end up, your group ends up knowing a bunch of other groups in different countries. So it's, there's definitely a bias there. In more rural areas, I, I would pretty much assume that it's, it's the exact opposite. But with the advent of dating apps, most um most gays who make their gay debut have been on it at least once twice or still on it so that one's a little bit more difficult um and th this is probably sampling bias but i know the majority of um, gay men that i do know are still on those dating apps uh just at least for hookup purposes or to quote unquote see who's around C correct me um, if i'm wrong but to my knowledge, Grinder was big before Tinder ever was, or even existed possibly. I remember I, I had some gay associates well over a decade ago, and they were they would actively speak of Grinder. I knew virtually not, nothing about this, but I found out about it at the time. Tinder, I don't know when Tinder emerged, but um, I don't think it, it. It certainly wasn't around ten years ago. I don't believe it was. So it was around like 2012, 2013, I believe. Mm -hmm. It was, it was pretty early on back then. Yeah. Uh, at the time, of, I guess, maybe five years ago, I would say that with the gay community, Tinder was more so used for dating, um, like actual dating, getting to know the person, but it's turned into another grinder. So it's, it's the same thing. Except it's slightly less superficial because the population on Tinder seems to be a lot less good looking well and, and there you have of course but there's the sampling yeah. bias so, so 
Definitely. Oh, it, it, this is just sheer, this is a question of sheer numbers, right? In mm-hmm. the case in the case of uh, Tinder, I mean, there is more. We just there, there's many many more heterosexual people than there are um, the homosexual men or gay men, pardon. And so, of course, you're going to have more people in the mean or or below, even below the mean than a population that's much smaller that you know you're, i think that that's a perfect example of sampling bias i mean and especially if even if people don't feel naturally inclined they feel kind of social peer pressure from society at large to participate in things like tinder i, mean, I can say for the record that if i if if i were a much younger person i almost certainly would not bother with, with tinder I just would not sync with my own inclinations um, if I had an interest in these sort of things I just it wouldn't be for me but I think that yeah it's just there's just a lot more people on tinder I would say compared to grinder and so that's gonna change things but to, to get back to the original question so there's the commonality factor there's the sort of novelty accessory factor but what interests me as well is the and sort of sociocultural landscape that women in general have tried to at least project their goals and their interests as somehow being fundamentally aligned with with gay men as if there were there's just so much over i mean yes we've discussed some overlap but as if they're identical uh and i have a number of sort of hypotheses that, that might support that for one thing i think that women obviously can't exert a, a sexual charm or influence over gay men because you guys like the peepees as opposed to the fish holes. So that's that's a disadvantage. I mean, that's, that's, the, that's the cardinal power women have over men, straight men at least. The, um, and so there has to be some other lure there, you know, whether treat them nicely, consider them part of the fold uh, in order to, because... I think this is just simple evolution. Um, the weaker sex needs to develop social tools to manipulate people in order to achieve their goals rather than the more direct route a straight man might take. This seems to be another way of bringing a disparate group into the fold that they otherwise would not have an influence on. And then likewise, I think it, it depends on the individual, obviously, but there are a lot of straight men in my observation that feel very, very uncomfortable I wouldn't even say dealing with uh, gay men, but even with their existence, as if they're, you know, it's something, and sometimes it's religiously motivated, but sometimes it goes well beyond that. And I think that that sort of shunning, that lack of desire to acknowledge or even interact with gay men would also uh, create a sort of push and pull effect. And then, then in, in this scenario, gay men would be more, naturally be more inclined to associate with women because women aren't going to reject them outright at the social level. Whereas straight men, you know, at worst case scenario, they're, you know, horrible things are done to gay men, but in, in even best case, in many cases, it's sort of tolerated. Um, it's, it's, I, I say that among straight men, in my experience, I have a rare sort of interest. It's mostly based on the sort of the sociobiology behind it and, and homosexuality that, you know, I, I don't really find common. Most gay, straight men I, I know just find, feel very uncomfortable in general. And so they would sooner push the, the gay men into the fold of the sisterhood uh, as opposed to just accepting them as, as, as fellow men, at least on some level. And then, of course, the, the earlier point with women, I think that creates a dynamic in the larger socio-political landscape, cultural landscape, where there's this perception that there's this de facto alliance between women and gay men, and particularly their their interests, that there's that much overlap. When in reality, the we talk about real interests, whether it's, um, I mean, you're training to be a doctor to be, whether medical expenditures for health causes related to specific uh, diseases that tend to be more sex specific, or general perception, the problem, I would say, with this is that at the end of the day, gay men are still men. And so the value assigned to gay men superficially might have some overlap or be congruent with uh, with women's value superficially. 
but again in in the final analysis it can't be because you guys are men as well and you're not giving birth you lack the magic womb and and from this very you know sperm are cheap and wounds right are so yeah. yeah yeah so you you definitely get some gay men who make a deal with um straight women that can i have your eggs mm. and this is i wouldn't say like quote unquote common but you hear about it enough to the point where um the women will have will happily be okay with it um that wasn't really wasn't entirely my angle that's an interesting side artifact it was more that yeah there's gonna be a a push and pull effect because most straight men are going to reject the company of gay men not least of which because there can and has been between straight and gay men, one side is sexual attention, you know, sort of unrequited love or what have you. I've, I've borne witness to it myself, and I've seen it happen in other cases. And I think um, that that can create a, a, a pressure, a, a push, a push, a, an effect to push away uh, gay men. But I mean, my mostly my point was about the fact that women. Women's interests are not really gay men's interests because you're still you're still biological male, and so you're more likely to not you're more you you're de facto more likely to suffer prostate from prostate cancer or some or testicular cancer than you are uterine cancer or breast cancer. Right? It's sort of there are certain biological facts that really cut through the the socio political cultural BS. Which is to say, I mean, being very sort of using the medical examples, but I think in general that despite gay men look being viewed as a sort of vulnerable minority, uh, effectively, and how they're treated at large, you still have the same value of a man, arguably even less in some cases, because you're more, you're less inclined to inseminate women, and you're also not going to. And this is, I think, a really salient factor here you're not going to spend oodles of money on a woman. You're not going to be courting her. Uh, the entire, I mean, I've proposed this hypothetical scenario a number of times, but imagine a world where a majority of men were gay. The entire uh, Twitch and certainly only fat, well, not all of it, but much of it would, would collapse in itself because you're not going to spend money on that sort of thing. So I think that, that, that this creates natural momentum to, in addition to the things that you cited earlier, to want to associate uh, with with women, but at the same time, I think gay men probably should be if aware, if not hyper aware, of the fact that you're still a man, and so your value is more or less the same as that of a man. You you know, sperm are cheap. You don't have a womb, so yeah, yeah. That's kind of the way gay men kind of treat each other at the same time. I find it interesting that that you think that if the world were majority gay men that only fans would collapse i think it would still be progressing in, in its same direction but even worse actually hmm. just because Why? Um, because the culture is so um puts hy- hypersexuality so high you you get a, a decent amount of the population actually starting their own only fans whether that be college students uh, or whether it be just another model, a regular model, mm. um, or even points us at the same time. It's, it's one, it's one of the things that a lot of, uh, gay men, whether they were, or they are masculine or feminine or similar to women where they're so sexual that they're perfectly okay with creating their own only fans. Um, if you go on a few of the more popular gay men's pages, on Instagram, originally they were just doing fitness on Instagram or like a Kardashian shoot where she broke the internet. Um, usually they will tend to totally be okay with OnlyFans or starting their OnlyFans um, type of thing. I know that for me myself, I'm, I have mutual friends who have started an OnlyFans and even if they're not that popular, it's something within the culture that is supported. Yeah, so, I don't, I don't. Fu- well, okay. So let me nitpick some of the things you said there. I mean, I don't okay, go for it. Go ahead. Or disagree with that, but 
I mean, the, my understanding of OnlyFans, and I've spent some time investigating this for videos and just my general interest, not to, as participate, but to understand the phenomenon as it's, it's, it's very much an emergent one still, mm -hmm. is that much of the clientele, if you want to call them that, who support uh, the, what let's call them, uh, the workers there, yes, the female workers. Now, a lot of these guys, they're looking for something very specific. They're term typically lonely, they're bereft of female company, they just don't really have access to these things. And my analysis is that it's, it's a quick way to gain a kind of pseudo-intimacy. Now, if, if it's the case that sexual access, and maybe even as a consequence or some kind of emotional intimate access is more, more readily available for many gays. I wouldn't think that you get the same rates of participation and mm -hmm. moreover the point it might, it might in some way, shape or form continue to exist, but the, the women themselves wouldn't, I mean, they'd be out of business obviously, because you're not going to be spending time, energy and money investigating in some kind of investing in some kind of pseudo intimate scenario with a, with a woman on or a female on, on OnlyFans. Right. But at the same time, gay men are still trying to attract men at the end of the day. And if you're not the best looking guy, then you end up with, with some cases where you, you really can't find someone mm -hmm. to hook up with. Right. And you have some cases where, men just kind of just turn to only fans for the intimacy for the chance to talk to someone who is extremely good looking it's it's the same as some straight men you still suffer from the same thing interesting um but it's it's still i would say just as bad because because of how important it is to have a good body to make sure that your face is a certain way and that's why um a lot of gay men uh, in the city do engage with uh, plastic surgery to a certain level, right? Because these are the type of men that you kind of want to attract, right? Mm -hmm. But you still have to catch the eye somehow. And if you can't catch the eye, you turn to OnlyFans <laughs> for, that, for that level of intimacy, right? Yeah, I've, I've heard, I mean, this is anecdotal. I... Uh... I know of one example of a, a purportedly straight man who, who apparently a large majority of his OnlyFans audience are gay men. That's where he makes the majority of his money. Um, so it's entirely possible. But I, I still would think that the dynamic would be somewhat different. I don't think it's just a sort of one to one. Oh yeah, yeah. I don't think it's one to one. I don't think it's yeah. one to one. Yeah, yeah. yeah just because. Um... Sex is something that's so readily available mm. on Grinder, so it's it's really easy to get. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, but even then, you have people paying other guys just to um, hook up with them or give them some kind of attention in some kind of way. So, but the relationship is different from uh, straight people in the sense that it's it's a lot more explicit it's in your face like you know what you're gonna get it's one and done you know the the relationship there's no there's nothing really hidden underneath it hmm. so right yeah. so you're not necessarily getting the quote-unquote intimacy because i think that behind whether it's twitch thoughtery or uh, only fans <clears throat> much of this is just fueled by this desire to establish some kind of human connection. Of course, with the heterosexual quote unquote community, it's such an odd word. It, um, there's also sort of lack of sexual access, right? So that's there, there's that too. But I think that's the real sort of revolutionary aspect of, of only fans and the like it, it's, it creates a, a platform for kind of pseudo intimacy and, and clearly the guys feel as if they're getting something out of it on some level so yeah yeah so i mean it's it's something common that you find amongst the uh sexually positive gay men mm -hmm. yeah now in the next oh sorry no, no no please go ahead i was gonna say that the next um thing with with the uh 
it, we were talking about this earlier where the relationship between gay men and women usually tend to find two types of relationships either the group is majority gay and you have one woman or, or you have majority women and you have one gay man that's it you, you rarely find like very 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 rarely find a group that's mixed hmm. almost evenly amongst gay men and women what do you also, think mediates that what do you think is a major factor there or what's going on well the thing is is that if hanging out with gay men is your your top choice just because you you relate to them more you're just gonna not even look at women at all really and the only women that you you do look at that at one um woman in the majority gay group you'll find that they have a pretty big personality they're also entertaining as um in the sense that they know how to banter they know how to take a joke they're not sensitive at all right they will you can throw an insult at them and they'll throw another insult right back at you it, it's it's very the personality tends to be very amazonian in, in that kind of sense mm. right mm. Unless, unless they're beasts then then they're sensitive but that's another thing another stereotype i guess um and then in the groups where you have majority of women and then one gay man uh, usually find that the gay man has trouble making friends with other gay men in terms of just a purely platonic relationship so he just turns to women for that because he can't get that mm. with um other gay men usually tends to be the case so or just because there's, there's no other gay men around so that's why they go for the second pick but yeah and as to why there's no mixed group i just think that it's it becomes there's a lot of drama eventually and that's why those groups never happen i don't i really don't know why why, why that doesn't occur it, it beats me honestly well you did raise a point a little while ago i believe you said something to the effect of the that if the choice is there, gay men would much prefer to hang out with other gay men than with women. If yeah, I, but yeah. that doesn't that, that doesn't necessarily eliminate the idea that you can also bring multiple women to a group. Okay, well, but, th now we come to an interesting point here. Because you, you have a different perspective. I mean, you, you're not, you're not, you're you not really a normie. You're sort of aware of certain things. What is your own personal perspective and, and your observations of women? I mean, I, I, I don't get the feeling that you particularly enjoy their company. Um, with me, I did kind of grow up with hanging out with both men and women. So I could see the dynamic in their own spaces. So when I did hang out with women, I did i was very aware of how they treated men at a very early age where they would do that high-pitched voice and then ask men to do something for them and i was just kind of shocked at how effective that was at a very young age mm -hmm. so when i did see that i would personally i didn't like it i would tell um the girl that hey do you know that you're aware that you're doing this it's not it's not okay and seeing that happen often time and time again it just maybe kind of not interact with women as much there's very few that i do in, that i do choose to in, interact with and they tend to be a lot more intelligent funny blah 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 blah, right um uh, so, so that's, uh, and i you had a natural born immunity to this sort of thing what, what was the response of these these women or these young females at the time when you pointed that out um, it was, it was pure shock. It's usually pure shock uh, when I point it out because if I talk to other women about the high pitched voice, they totally understand. A, a really good example of this of women using their high pitched voice to get what they want is Pokemon, for example. Right in her recent apology video, she doesn't use her her normal voice. She actually talks at a higher pitch than what she usually does, and that's and that's a manipulation tactic that I see happen 
a lot of the time. And a lot of straight men are not conscious of this, I guess, just because women will use this voice practically all, every single time that they're interacting with a, a man that they want to either use or to attract. And when they're talking to their gay friends, this voice goes away. It's gone. Like, you don't hear it at all. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's very apparent um, to me when I, when I hear this or see that. Um, sure. Yeah, and even with um, one of my more recent interactions within, like, the past one, two years, I did have one girl. She was 18 years old. She was using guys to do things for her and she would talk in a high-pitched voice and it got to a point where uh, she got her ex-boyfriend to drive all the way to drive eight hours to her to see her get back into a relationship with her and then for her to convince him to go into an open relationship and then i saw her use another guy basically as a chauffeur um yeah with with the hype voice, everything it, it was incredible to me to see uh, all of that, um, and I'm just watching all of this at a distance, and it just makes me personally very aware of it. And it even got to a point where she kind of asked me to be her chauffeur so that she could, um, uh, so that she could buy her birth control bills too which i found very interesting but now you have your you know you have a natural immunity to this disease so i presumably you didn't acquiesce to her demand oh no i didn't no 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 i just asked her why <laughs> and then she was shocked and she slowly backed away and she she never asked me again uh you could have said you do realize i'm not straight and i have no interest in your vagina right i mean I feel like that's kind of obvious, but... Yeah, yeah but it, it... I think at times, I mean, this is, seems a perfect case of women just overstepping their boundaries in the sense that so unaware that they she actually thought that you would acquiesce to her, to you, to her demand that you should be her chauffeur when you have at, at literally zero sexual interest in her, as if she wasn't aware that her, her entire manipulation tactic hitherto had been predicated solely on that, you know? Yeah. At the same time, you you do get some women who have that fantasy of uh, making a gay man straight. <laughs> so I think she was one of those. But I see. yeah. But it's just it's just one of those uh, things that I saw a lot growing up that I was very aware of, and I never. I, I think I would shock a lot of a lot of women whenever whenever I would just ask them why or like oh can't you get someone else to do that for you or just straight up reject it in any kind of way because I I did hang out with um, many different groups I didn't really belong to any one group growing up so hmm. well it, I was able to kind of yeah I'm sorry I, I don't I don't think it's uh, shocking at all uh, it's just it is it's perfectly logical the reason why men do things for women and this was the point i made at the very beginning of the video uh, was that is that they have a sexual interest in a reproductive interest it, now it's one thing but and here's the thing is that it's interesting that when women make these requests of men straight men that is that request is not predicated on a, a sense of mutuality or mutual respect or just sort of a friendship, a uh, sort of uh, tit for tat. It's again predicated on this to this the sexual dynamic largely, and I, I think it would be very different if a, a friend, whether male or female, asked you for a favor to you know to take him to a pharmacy or something. Assuming that the reasoning for that was not just oh can you can you please take me to get my birth control or something along those lines. Yeah, I mean it. Honestly, if it was something, if she had asked me, uh, and she was just straight up with it, I probably would have just said yes because that that would have been some kind of level of mutual respect. But clearly, it wasn't. So, hmm. yeah, it's just one of those cases. I'm just like, eh. But 
yeah, I think a lot of gay men are uh, accustomed to these kinds of things. Or, like, even you, you get the case with um, feminine gay men where women will ask them to do makeup for them, yeah. and the gay men will happily oblige just because it's a shared interest and he gets to practice his craft. So, yeah, yeah there are it, a number of these makeup artists on YouTube who happen to be gay. So, uh, yeah, and some of them are pretty big, doing it better than women. <laughs> Unsurprising. Yeah, but so I I think it's not unreasonable to say that you don't particularly enjoy the company of women. Most women, yes, hmm. yes, I do. I don't. Yeah, yeah. I, I have to. I share that sentiment. Now, yeah. go on. Oh, I said yeah, yeah, yeah. And here's the thing, though the again the overwhelming social dynamic the perception is that you know gay men and women are on each other's side and there's some sort of thing and i've also observed this in my own life because when you're discussing female problematic female behavior to use current year tech terminology gay men are complete largely in my unsympathetic you're being a, a large exception here but they, they just they have no idea what women are like in the context of relationships. And they certainly don't observe their general behavior. They're just sort of, they just look at them as, I guess, just people, and they are people, obviously. But um, I think that for the most part, I don't, uh, you being the exception, there's not a lot of self awareness in, in terms of the dynamics there. They just assume you know, there's some baseline alliance there or, or similarity. And so that's all you need to really work with. I, most human beings don't really think about these things very much. So, Yeah, that's, that's something sad, but true. Nothing really new. Uh, but I do find that the... I would say that the small sort of gay men that I do know, that although this is sampling bias again, they tend to stay away from women also. Not necessarily on purpose, just because their interests really don't align. It, it, it gets to an extreme where um, once gay men have, fi- have found their clique, you, you really won't see them hang out with women that much. You really won't. Uh. Yeah. They'll just choose to opt out and go away. Um, what I find yeah. really interesting, because you've pointed this out before, is that there's virtually no, as in zero, overlap in terms of interaction between gay men and lesbian women, or, or yeah. And if if it's the case that gay men do spend time with uh, straight women because of some old, you know, similarity of interest or whatever, propose that I would propose that there's there's no there's neither a similarity of interest nor any motivation whatsoever. What do what do gay men have to uh, gain from association with lesbian women, and vice versa? Nothing. I mean, certainly politically, there's this sort of what is it? Sorry, LGBTQ plus or whatever it's called. I've lost track. I don't right. know all these things. But the reality behind that, I think, is the irony is that in terms of LG, whatever the the lesbian aspect with the gay aspect, there's just there's there's no overlap. There, you have no reason to associate with each other whatsoever. Yeah, you find that politically they will, but the reality is that they, they really don't associate with each other. Um, you'll find that a lot of gay men do not like lesbians, and a lot of lesbians do not like gay men. Yeah, they, they, they really, they're just two different communities. They'll stay far, far apart. You'll find small exceptions here. They have, that's, that's a lot more rare. Yeah. Yeah, and, I mean, one would think it would be the, ba- the only possible not... Uh, basis of a friendship without sexual tension, you know, a, a lesbian woman and a, and, a, and a gay man, if only because they're not interested in each other, and yet they seem, in terms of mentality, sufficiently different. I, I find that fascinating because it might, I, I don't, I, haven't, I don't know if there are any studies on this, but are, are, do, are, is there some, in the same sense that there's some overlap between female and, and uh, straight female brains and, and gay brains is, perhaps some overlap between lesbian brains and straight male brains. And so 
you don't there's just not that much interaction because they don't even have that much in common to begin with despite not in theory that would be the perfect basis for a friendship with no sexual tension right but then again you you find that a lot of lesbians don't like men in general like they just don't they'll just opt out um and with regard to um brains being similar there have been a few studies on transgender um males to females their brains in particular being closer to biological women than biological men in some regard but I, i'm not aware of any study being done on uh gay men although that kind of study would be a lot more rare to find just due to the controversy mm. behind it oh yeah so yeah, yeah I, I don't i don't think especially these days you and i both know how political correctness have been, has been uh you know dialed up to the to the to an insane level i think any sort of no we've talked about this i mean uh we don't want to bore people but we um our uh, our budding friendship is in part motivated by our <laughs> rarefied interests in linguistics so the, the fact that you do you mind would it bother you to re, re uh, regale us with the story of what you wanted to investigate uh, and what your professor told you at the time because that would be very telling oh yeah so i wanted to look into the differences between language acquisition in men and women when they are adults acquiring their second language hmm. and when I brought this idea up to my professor, he, he said to me, yeah, don't do that study outright. If you do decide to do that study, I would hide it in another study and then just sneak it in there as a small observation. And you would be able to get the research that you wanted on top of something else, but most of it would kind of be hidden into a small blurb. Within Which that, that research totally defeats the purpose of of the the research to begin with because this seems to me that I would think there would have to be some differences uh, on some level at least and if you don't approach it from that hypothesis to begin with and you just sort of yeah as you put it sneak it in some blurb uh, in, in the in a body of a massive research paper this doesn't really you're kind of missing the point right but I definitely yeah and this this of course is uh, the state of affairs you can't really investigate these sorts of things everything is hush hush and yeah so i guess there'll never be any research seen uh, examining say lesbian brains versus uh, others and I, I i get it on some level i mean nobody wants to be singled out um i mean i i'm i'm weird in that you know, I'm not terribly tall. I'm 174. If somebody wanted to conduct, a, you know, an examination on, you know, short men's brains, I would think, okay, why not? But I, I can understand if you're part of some group and not wanting to be, but it's just, it's a shame because it, it is interesting. Um, and not to get, I don't want to get too far in the linguistic line, but you know, the way men and women use language tends to be different as well. Um, the lexical items they t typically use are different. Um, the social fa facts of peer pressure, I mean, let's not get too far in this, but it's an interesting question and nonetheless was not, you were not able to pursue or likely could not pursue it because of the current year politics and, and cultural uh, BS. So. Yeah, yeah. That's a maybe in 15 years. Maybe 15 years. <laughs> now, now, this this is based on the assumption that in 15 years, things are actually going to improve and be better as opposed to worse. Right. right. Well, personally, either way, I'm going to pursue it, I'll, even if I have to hide it into another study. So I hope so. That, I hope you, uh, you're you sure to win, you know tell me about the uh, results as well, because I'd be uh, fascinated by that. Oh, definitely. Even, um, but I, I'm pretty sure... Um, kind of tying it to the, the original topic. I, th I think you, you would find the links between gay men and, and straight women tend to be a lot more similar. Mm -hmm. Just because even if those groups don't necessarily align, you would probably find that they do have very, very similar structure, mm -hmm. whether phonologically or uh, in terms of syntax. Yeah. And now th this seems to be the cue for, uh, now that we've spoken for a while, to probably end the discussion is where entering into the territory that uh, tends to drive off and scare away the masses. 
<laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, I thought it was a uh, it was a nice discussion. I hope uh, the audience appreciated it. Um, it's uh, I, I find my conversation partner to be a truly rare individual. Not just in as much as he's gay, but he's a he's a smart guy, and I appreciate his existence. So, everyone, thanks for tuning in. <laughs> And, thank you. Uh, yes, and thank you for participating. And I will uh, check you guys out later, assuming I'm still alive. So take care. If you like this video, please like, share, and subscribe. And if you enjoy my content, please consider making a donation or becoming a patron. Thanks for watching.